We looked at this structure last week. Okay, so just to recap, risk management is broken up into two areas, the financing and the control. Is financing different from control? Yes. Very different. Okay, financing is looking at throwing rands and cents to help fix the problem. Okay, it will either be a problem that we fix ourselves, and that's a form of retention. Okay, so they call that self-insurance self-insurance or non-insurance you don't always have to insure it okay so retention means I keep the risk I either self-fund it or I don't worry about it I don't insure it and if it happens it happens okay risk financing that relates to transfer is using insurance okay that's when we approach the insurer and we take out cover for certain negative eventualities things that happen okay. right control is broken up into two areas avoidance and reduction when looking at control you're looking at other things that you can do that will help improve that the risk management okay so ways and means that we can implement in a business in an organization that can help with risk management is either by having more resources so we can self-fund or we can transfer risk in terms of financing or we can try control the risk by looking at avoiding certain risks or reducing certain risks and those don't necessarily have to uh, incur resources or expenses okay something simple we discussed last week as an example was getting um senior managers okay to authorize signatures different okay, authority levels it doesn't cost someone any financial, uh, there's no financial costs to asking a director to sign off on a payment before the payment is made. But that's a form yes. of control. Okay, segregation yes. of duties is a form of control. It's not risk financing. Um, by separating duties, it's a form of control. You're trying to avoid risk or you're trying to reduce the risk. Okay, then we've got the three processes, well, two processes. And um, they've got three like steps, okay? So the first one is looking at the identification, right? So we won't know if something is gonna affect us if we can't identify it. So we need to be able to identify risks and we need to be able to name them, okay? Identify them and know if they're insurable or not. Some risks are insurable, some risks aren't. And that's where the evaluation comes in. So when we look at evaluation, we're looking at the severity or the frequency. Right, severity is looking at how bad that effect is actually going to be or how or the extent to which um, the negative or the positive event is going to occur. Okay, remember risk doesn't always have to be negative, right? but we're looking at more the negative because we're trying to prevent companies from losing resources or for losing something. Okay, it could be profit, it could be other. All right, so risk evaluation. There could be risks that affect the business severely, and that's severity, or there could be risks that are small, but they, they occur often, right? The frequency of that event occurs often. So maybe just an, an example to discuss here, um, you could look at fraud that's committed by the directors of the company, that's severity. If one director commits fraud in the company, that company can go bankrupt. Yes. Frequency in terms of theft would be, um, let's say, petty theft. So um, let's say we're running a retail store. Customers are stealing from the business. All right, that's frequency. So you might have a lot of small items going missing. But fraud is the financial manager is literally cooking the books and stealing from the company. Okay, so the one is severe and the one is frequent. Okay, there are in instances where severity and frequency go together. Okay, so there may, there may be things that are frequent, okay, that are also severe potentially. Okay, and that's something that we need to address. Obviously, you want to keep, okay, so which risks are you going to identify as being the worst? I will say the fraud. Okay, so do you agree risks that have a high level of severity? Yes. Is a high yep. level of frequency also an area that's a, uh, that's a concern? Um, yes, it is. You'd have to find ways to combat it, but it's not uh, serious. Well, 
it is something that you need to consider, as you said, way, ways to combat it. So if, if our customers are taking from the business, they, yeah. we need to do something about it. We can't have that happen yeah. every year. Yes. All right, that's good. Okay, so how do we then approach control? Well, when looking at that specific area, the control part of it, okay, in terms of risk management, the process, there we're looking at financial or we're looking at physical. Those are the two groups where they split it into. Okay, so the first is very similar to what we saw earlier on the other diagram. Financial, looking at retention or transfer. So we keep the risk, we finance it ourselves, or we transfer it to the insurer. And then the insurer is then going to carry the risk of that event occurring. So if something bad happens, they'll provide us with cover. Physical, we either eliminate or we minimize. Those are two ways to help control risk. So physical, okay. let's say um, physical remedies, okay? Physical remedies would be elimination or minimization. How do we eliminate or minimize the effects of bad things occurring? All right, and then last bit over here is just a recap about insurance, which you actually mentioned a bit earlier when I asked you what you remembered from last week. Insurance was one of the topics, and you told me that insurance is a product, okay, something that we're going to be using to obviously help the business handle certain risks. Okay, so that's the main bit, handling of risk. Okay, R insurance isn't risk management. Risk management is much bigger, it's broader. Okay, so risk management is actually that, and insurance is just gonna help. It's just that, like that, that helper. Okay, so that risk management is everything. That's the, that's the first bit that we need to establish. Okay, the, the, the main topic is risk management and insurance is just a byproduct of it. Okay. Right, do you remember what the pooling of funds is? Mm -hmm. This is looking at the working of the insurance industry. So insurance industries, insurers focus on this, pooling of funds for uncertain events. Can you remember? Okay, let's do this. Okay. The example we spoke about last week, mm -hmm. you said you've never ever been in an accident. You haven't had to claim for the last few years, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so are you still paying your premium towards your insurance, your car insurance? Yes, I am. All right, because I mean, you haven't claimed for the last few years, so why are you still paying a premium? Because anything can happen at any time. Okay, because it's an uncertain event. Okay, you're worried that you could possibly be in a car accident, right? Yes. Okay, but your insurer is probably looking at your profile and saying, well, Melanie's a really good client to have for us. The audio is not too clear now. Is the audio not so clear? Yes. There's like an interruption. Okay. All right, so I was saying in terms of the insurer, the insurer is going to be very happy with Melanie as the client, right? Yes, yes. Why? Because they're pooling funds for uncertain events. So obviously the insurer is going to cover certain individuals if they're in accidents. The ones that yes. aren't in accidents are actually, inverted commas, helping to pay for the damages of those who are in accidents. Yes. Okay, and that's the pooling of funds. So insurers are almost like public piggy banks, if you will, okay, where you're taking from everyone, you're saving it in a specific, um, let's say, institution, okay, being the insurer, and then allo um, allocations are made from the actual savings towards certain negative things that do arise, okay, for, for cover, All right? And that's how insurers run their business. So insurers make a profit off uncertain events. Oh. Yes. Okay, so another example, um, life cover. Do you have life cover? Yes. Okay. All right, so obviously um, you and your, your, uh, your spouse will have life cover yes. because you've got a, a, a child. Yes. Okay, so should something happen to you and your husband, what would happen to your son? Uh, he, he's going to be, be left well all taken. alone. 
Yes. Right? So do you want your son to be left all alone if something happens to mom and dad? No. No, you don't. Okay, and that's why you have something like life cover and other policies to provide for those negative things that could possibly happen in terms of uncertain events. No one ever knows what's going to happen. Yes. Right, but and that's what insurers do in terms of the uncertainty. Okay, so insurers actually feed off people's insecurities. <laughs> okay, that's how insurers run their business, insecurities. Okay, so you can take out insurance on anything that you're feeling insecure about. Okay, so you've probably heard of some celebrities taking out insurance on their selves. Yes. Okay, and why? Because that's insecurity feeding that product. Okay, so insurers can insure certain celebrities for um, certain things. I mean, we'll see some examples in your textbook. They talked about um, someone's voice, a popular singer. Okay, a popular mm -hmm. singer insured his voice, all right, for mm -hmm. a huge amount. Because remember, a singer relies on their voice in order to perform. So if they lose yes. their voice, does that create loss for that individual? Yes. Yes, and because they believe they're going to lose something if they lose their voice, they can take out a policy or a product that's going to satisfy that worry, okay, or that concern. Okay, so no one wants to be in a car accident. So you have worry and you have concern. So what can someone do? They can give you peace of mind to say, well, we'll help you repair the vehicle, right? So they're, they're, so they're providing a solution to your insecurity. That's the focus. That's what an insurer does. It's, they're looking at pooling of funds for uncertain mm -hmm. events that people have that are going to result in negative uh, or um, financial loss or, or negative um, consequences. Okay. So study unit three, looking at the short-term insurance market. As I said, here we're looking more at roles. We'll be looking at different role players. Okay, so who do we need to be mindful of in this particular industry? Okay, it's always short-term because this whole module is looking at short-term. We'll describe the market. We'll look at some relationships. Uh, we'll look at different associations in terms of the regulation. Okay, so who regulates what? Why are they there? Uh, what purpose do they play in that specific area? Okay. First bit, two questions for you to consider. Let's ask you what these are. Okay, so what is the short-term insurance uh, market? Um, how would you define it? If someone didn't know what it is, how would you describe it to them? Something that's obviously short-term. So what does that involve? Uh, uh, like short-term events. Like if my car gets... Uh, scraped or something like that. Okay, that so day-to-day -day running of the business or day-to-day -day yeah. operating or, or just living okay. in general. Yeah. Okay, good. And then insurance market, so that's the short-term insurance market. How would you describe that? Mm -hmm. What's a market? We spoke about a market in investments as well. What is a market? Uh, market is where everything occurs, everything that's taken into consideration. Okay, so what is a supermarket? Well, what's that's where you find... supermarket? Is it Gateway? No, no, is, no Gateway's in Cape Town. Um, what's the big mall no, no, in... No, no, What's the big mall Gateway in... Gateway is in... Gateway is here. It's oh, in... It uh, it's a bit more further, yeah. Okay, it's Gateway more is north. in Cozumatel. Um, oh, what am yeah. I thinking of? Oh, I'm thinking of the VNA. Okay, that's the waterfront. Yeah. You guys have the promenade. Uh, Pavilion. Pavilion yeah. is close to us. Pavilion? Yes, have you heard of Pavilion? Yeah, I have. Yes. Okay. That's more closer to me. Are, are you close to the promenade in Durban? Yes. Okay, wow. All right, so in terms of shopping, you go to the supermarket, right? Yes. So a market for insurance would be what? The buying place. The buying place, yes. Yeah, so if I'm looking for insurance, I go to the short-term insurance market. Okay, you're not yes. really going to go to your supermarket to buy financial products. Right, they, they no. do actually offer... Um, a financial product. They could offer credit. Sometimes yeah. they even offer insurance for certain items. So like if you had to take out insurance on your phone, that comes from the provider. So they're actually an insurer in a sense. 
So which um, which network are you on? Um, it's Telcom. Telcom. All right. So did you take up the insurance offer on your phone, your device? No. No, you didn't. Okay. But if you did, then you're actually a client. So you're a, a client of the insurer being Telcom. Okay. The company that's offering you the device. Yes. Okay. So insurance is just the marketplace. That's all it is. So when we talk about what is the short term insurance marketplace, it's a place where buyers and sellers meet to exchange a specific financial product. And the financial product we're looking at here is policies, okay, contracts, right, insurance contracts. That's the focus. Okay, remember, we're looking at people's uncertainty. We're looking at people's insecurity. And by feeding off the insecurity, we're creating lots of products for the masses. Okay, so the mass appeal for, ins uh, for car insurance is, well, you never have to worry about being in a car accident because the repairs will be paid for. Yes. Okay, and that's what we're looking at there. And that's what insurers do. Right, some people love the insurance industry, some people hate the insurance industry. So what view do you have on the insurance industry? Which boat do you I think sit in? Or are you on the fence? Uh, I think it's important to have insurance. Okay, so, so you're, you're, you're positively viewing insurance and you're actively debating and discussing it with everyone. So whoever, so if you hear someone who says, well, the car isn't insured. You're the first person that says, why not? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so Melanie has a very positive view on the short-term insurance industry or the insurance industry as a whole. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Great. Okay. So everyone's different. Um, I've had students that love the industry. I've had students that hate the industry. I've had a wide variety in the past. So it's just interesting to hear what your view is. Okay. So why do you have that view? Um, I think it's important because, I mean, um, if you live, like in KZN, there's so much of accidents every day on the road. Yeah. And uh, when things like this happen, you have to make sure that you're covered. I mean, no one has like 200,000 just sitting in your bank account to replace your car. Yeah. A car is a necessity because you use that for work. Yeah. And then um, what about illnesses? If you have a dreaded disease. Uh, I have a sister who has cancer and um, she was just diagnosed a year ago and sure. now when you uh, covered with insurance you you uh, like a dreaded disease cover yes. that covers your medical your medical expenses so I Correct, think for yeah. me it's from my uh, personal view it's important okay so in terms of insurance policies you've got cover for everything except your cell phone yes <laughs> <laughs> okay that's great all right, so who are some of the main role players then, Melanie? You've mentioned some examples, so can you think of who actually, who, who actually participates in that environment? I think it's uh, the clients. Good, that's one. Important. Yeah. And then the people that sell the insurance. Okay, that's two. What the do we insurers. call people who sell insurance? The insurers. The brokers. The no, brokers, the insurers yes. are separate. Okay, be careful. Okay, okay so you've got clients. Yes. You've got insurer, and then you have the broker in okay. the middle. Okay. Oh, yes. yes. All right. So, so when you bought your insurance policies, you would have most likely have done it through a broker. Yes. Okay. Good. What other role players are there? So those are three big role players. There are others as well. Third party. <laughs> what third party role players? Um, uh, people. Okay, just say I caused an accident. Yeah. That third part. That third person would be putting a claim through my insurance. Okay, uh, that's uh, that's slightly different. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that okay. um, scenario in terms of um, how that process works. But um, if we think more general in terms of role player and not and not so specific. Okay. Um. Do we only have these three? The client, the broker, and then the show, and that's it. Uh, the underwriter. Okay, all right. So now we're looking more in terms of the insurer where you've got an underwriter. Okay, that could expand on, yes. on that area. And what else? Mm. Do all these people agree on everything? 
No. No. So there needs to be some form of regulation. Yes. Okay. Or what about dispute resolution? Okay. So mm -hmm. you haven't had to claim from your insurer yet. So you probably haven't had any bad experiences. But have you heard of any bad experiences where you actually have been paying all your premiums? You've had the mm -hmm. policy for a few years. Um, your car is covered. But then when claiming for damages for a specific um, event, your insurer refused to pay. Would you be a happy client? Yep. No, definitely Probably not. not. Okay, so mm -hmm. that can arise. So now what happened in that situation? You need to go to some form of third party in terms of a regulator yep. or an ombud, uh, the yep. ombudsman, and you're going to have to address that issue okay, to res resolve the, um, the, the, the dispute. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, would lawyers be part of the role players? Yes. Possibly. Okay, so there could yes. be a lot of other role players as well. Okay, we're just going to focus obviously on the major ones. Right, so okay. here's a note about the overview. Okay, which is what we actually spoke about now. Just obviously the picture's a bit better in terms of layout. Okay, so who are we looking at meeting in terms of their requirements? Mm. The client. Right? Okay. Yes. The client is key. Okay, so everything revolves around the client. They are the buyers of the products and services. Right, the client could be a business, the client could be an individual, it doesn't matter. Okay, but they're utilizing that particular product. And the product is offered by the intermediary or the representative or the broker, which is what we said earlier. Someone who sells the product. Because remember, in insurance, can insurance sell itself? No. No, you need someone to convince you to buy that insurance, right? Okay, sometimes you even convince yourself to buy the insurance. Yes. So, so for example, um, the broker that went to you, Melanie, to, to sell you your car insurance, your, yes. that broker didn't have to do much in terms of persuasion to get you to buy the no. product because you already know how important it is because you're, yes. um, you, you have noted that car accidents in KwaZulu-Natal are very, very problematic. Okay, so you, you're already sold in terms of the actual product. Yes. Okay, um, what the broker might have had to have done is give you either comprehensive cover or third-party liability or they, or they could package it differently, maybe a package that offers you a certain bonus for not claiming those types of things. So that's more their role. Their role is more to give you the detail around the product because not everyone will have that information, right? And is insurance very easy to understand? Uh, not everything is easy. No, it's important okay. to read the terms and conditions. Correct. Yeah. Um, there are contracts. So there are lots and lots of terms and conditions. So if we don't understand those terms and conditions, if we don't have the knowledge around that product, we may or may not be covered in certain eventualities. So there could be exclusions that we're not aware of. There could be exceptions we're not aware of. And that's obviously something that needs to be communicated to us. So as the broker, their responsibility is actually supposed to be to provide us with the information. Okay, so they should be telling us about what is and what isn't covered. Okay, are we comfortable with this or aren't we? And if, and, and if we're not, then if we include it on the policy, what's the cost going to be, etc. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Yes. So that leaves us with one other role, which we said was the insurer. Okay, and what do they do? They provide the product. Okay, so the insurer provides the product. Someone else sells the product. So they convince the client that it's important, okay, or that it's required. The buyer accepts the product, so they're the insured. Okay, we need to change the names here to use the correct vocabulary. Okay, insured. Okay, so we talk about the insured. The insured is the client. The insured is the business. It's the person using the product. Right, then you've got okay. other providers. You've got not providers, you've got other role players. Okay, we spoke mm -hmm. about the providers, then you've got the regulators, you've got other suppliers, okay, and you've got other players. Right, that forms part of this larger market. Okay, and you mentioned a nice word earlier. You said underwriter. Where would the underwriter yeah. fit in here? 
Um, right on top. Correct. Other players, definitely. Good. Yeah, so the underwriter would be up here because what is their role specifically? Um, what what do they do? An underwriter. What does an underwriter do? Any um, idea? I think. Yeah. Uh, I think it's their product. No, it's not the product. You can have a separate underwriter doing work for an insurer. Underwriting is actually a role. It's a service that's provided to the insurer. Okay. Any idea? Try again. No. Okay. So the underwriter is the specialist that can identify what the actual risk is. The insurer is just the one with the pool of funds. Okay. Okay, so in the um in reality, okay, underwriters are normally separate from insurers because underwriters normally serve as different insurers. Okay, so can you can you give me some good examples of big insurers in the country? Santam, Sunlam. Yeah. Alexander Forbes. Okay. All right. So if we look at those three, okay, those three are more uh, more likely associated with the word insurer. Okay. So product provider rather than underwriter. Okay. Underwriters okay. are specialists where they actually underwrite or they estimate the risks associated. Okay. Before issuing the product. Right. So who would you trust more, the insurer or the underwriter? Underwriter. <laughs> Why? <clears throat> uh, because they're specialists. Yeah, they're specialists in uncovering the risk. They're not specialists in selling you a product. Yes. Okay, the insurer just wants, to, wants you to, to buy the product. That's their focus. Okay, obviously yes. they need to do things in line with the law, and that's why we have the regulators. Okay, because if we don't have the regulators, well, those insurers can sell you whatever insurance on whatever they want, and you'll, you'll just have to accept it. Yes. Okay, and that's why regulators regulate the industry. So insurers need to do underwriting first, and they need to establish risk and all of that before they actually issue the product. And it needs to be fair um, as, as, as according to the law. Okay. Okay. All right, so here's okay. a quick question. While we've got this whole uh, discussion about underwriter and insurer. Okay, so Melanie, in yes. terms of um, a scenario, so what would you do in this situation? Okay, so let's assume that you have two doctors that you, that you know. Okay, um, the one doctor is very, very, very honest, okay? Mm -hmm. But he isn't very good in terms of his practical ability as a, as a doctor, as, as in terms of, let's say, let's say they're surgeons. Okay, so you know okay. two surgeons. The one mm -hmm. surgeon is an honest, honest surgeon, but, okay... His technical skills aren't very good. Okay, so, so you're going to be a bit worried about his skill in terms of um, actually doing the surgery. And then you've got a second doctor, okay, who is such a good execu uh, exec um, performer. Okay, he's a great performer in terms of how he executes the actual surgery. Okay, he's brilliant. Okay, his, his technical ability is the best in the world. But that doctor is dodgy. Okay, you can't trust that individual. So if you're seeking okay, surgery yes. in terms of um, maybe a medical condition or, or whatever the case might be, which doctor would you approach? The first doctor. <laughs> the first one. So the one that's very, very honest, but he's, he's completely bad at his skills in terms of actually doing performing the surgery is that the one you're going to mm, go no, with? no 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 the second one <laughs> so you'll go with the second one who's a yes. scamster but brilliant at surgery yes because you can't uh, take the risk of him doing something wrong to you <laughs> all right but the the question i want to ask you is how do you know you actually need the surgery that's a difficult one, eh? <laughs> okay. So that's why that's why we need the underwriter and the and, and the insurer. That's that's exactly what we're dealing with. The the insurer, right, would be the perfect executioner uh, in terms of executing whatever the the job is. Okay, they're the provider. They perform what they need to perform. All right. Mm -hmm. The underwriter is that trust that trustworthy doctor that will give you a 
second opinion. Okay, so the answer maybe to that analogy would be, well, it depends on, are you seeking the doctor's advice or are you seeking the surgery? If you're seeking advice, you would ask the guy that's honest for his opinion on yeah. whether or not you need the surgery before you then go to the guy that can perform the surgery. Sure. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much why we have this in this industry. The underwriter actually determines the risk. Is the risk insurable? Is there actually something that we can insure against before we approach the insurer who actually provides you with the product? Okay, it's almost like that second level of, a, it's like that second opinion almost. Mm. Okay, and that's why when you, when, if you are ever ill or sick um, and you do go to a doctor, you always need to question, is this doctor telling me the truth or do I need a second opinion? Some people seek a second opinion. Especially if it's for some like massive um, medical treatment or something like that. It's always good to get a second opinion. Yes, true. Okay, and, and you normally ask people that you trust for their second opinion. Yes. Okay. All right, so coming back to the notes, here's our first group. Buyers. What is a buyer? It's uh, me. It's the client. It's the you. Name. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's us. Okay, it's, it's people making use of those policies, okay, of those Product. products. Yes. Okay, so we get four types. Private, commercial, corporate, and public. Private, you and I. Commercial, yes. small, be... and medium-sized yes. businesses. Mm -hmm. And then corporate, we're looking at large customers, large clients. Okay, and then okay. public bodies, we're looking at governments public institutions yeah. okay so that's the difference there do all of these individuals need insurance yes possibly okay remember risk management insurance is different insurance yeah. is the product risk management yeah. is trying to solve the problem so before we have the problem let's try fix it rather than have insurance to to solve something that has already happened okay so risk yes. management is looking at trying to treat the cause rather than the symptoms Mm -hmm. Okay, because think about it. If you're in an accident every year, what's the problem? Is the problem the car or the driver? The driver. Exactly. So taking out lots of insurance on the car isn't going to make you, or isn't going to stop you being in lots of accidents. Yes, it will. Do you agree? If you don't drive. Well, maybe if you, need you don't lessons. drive. Okay, but so, so you're, you're probably a very good driver on the road. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I try to be careful. <laughs> you see, because th that's something that you're, um, you're mindful of in terms of, so for example, you're, you're, um, you've got both. Okay, you're looking at the cause. So what is the cause of accidents? It's either bad driving or maybe drinking and driving or not following the yeah. rules of the road. Okay, that causes the accident. Okay, that's yeah. the cause of the accident. The insurance is treating the symptom. What's the symptom? Well, the smashed vehicle. Yes. Okay, so for you, you're looking at treating the cause rather than the symptom by having insurance. Having insurance doesn't solve the problem. Okay, we need to improve people's skill maybe on the road, or we need to make the road safer. We need to do something else um, to prevent more accidents rather than just selling people more policies. Selling people more car insurance policies doesn't make the roads any safer. Yes, Okay. Sure. All right, so what types of cover do we get? We get multi-peril policies uh, where you're covering multiple risks, right? So that's like covering your house and your car all under one policy. Okay. All right. Uh, policy wording and sections will differ. So depending on which provider you go to, they could refer to things slightly differently. So you gave a good example. Earlier you spoke about your sister having been diagnosed with cancer. Okay. So. Yeah. Certain companies will refer to it maybe as a dread disease. Other companies might refer to it as like a critical illness. So the wording will be very different, but the basics are still the same. They're still covering certain risks. Okay. Right. And then you also get all asset risk, which is looking at everything, basically. Okay. Okay. All right. So there's the note about private individuals. We're splitting them into different categories. So what categories of insurance would you and I consider? Well, these are some of them. Okay, and all of these are covered later in other sections. Okay, they look at yes. house owner's insurance. They look at householder's insurance. What's the difference here? Here's the keyword. That's what you should remember, holder. Okay, so if you're a holder of insurance, 
What are you doing? Think of think of your hands. If you're holding your house, if you turn your house upside down, yes. okay, whatever falls out is contents. Yes. Okay. If you're the house owner, you own that house. So that's the structure. Okay, so it's more the structural versus the contents. So house owners insurance covers the actual building and anything fixed to the building. Householders okay. insurance covers the contents of the actual dwelling. Okay, where you're actually located. Okay, so householder, if you turn anything upside down, whatever falls out of the house is contents. And that's covered under separate policy. Okay. okay. Right, all risk is covered for property whilst away from the dwelling. So it doesn't matter where you are. If it's all risk, we can be home, we can be at work, we can be anywhere in the world. So long as we've got all risk covered for those items, okay, they'll be replaced should something happen to them. Okay. Personal liability. Who is this important for? Um. We spoke about an example earlier. We spoke about doctors. Do you think they'll need personal liability cover? Yes. Why? Um, just say an operation has gone wrong. Correct. Okay, and, and can operations go wrong? Yes. But what do doctors do? They, they, they try limit the extent to which operations can go wrong, right? Yes. Okay, so you've probably heard of those attorneys that represent people for malpractice, medical malpractice. Yes. yes. Okay, so as a doctor, do you agree? It's actually very, very stressful being a doctor. Can you imagine being a doctor and, and operating on someone? Mm -hmm. And let's say you're doing everything you possibly can to save that person's life, but they still die. Yes. What are, what are the loved ones going to say about your skill in the, in, in the operation, operating room? They're going to say you killed whoever. They, exactly. They're probably going to question, did you follow procedure correctly? Did you do everything you were supposed to? Yes. Okay, and that's a liability for the doctor. The doctor can't go to court every minute of their lives to represent themselves because they did everything they possibly could, but the patient still died. True. Okay, and that's why they need liability cover for legal liability. Right, so those are things that different individuals need to consider. Okay, motor insurance, we've, we've spoken quite a bit about it last week and this week as well. That's car insurance. And then personal accident. Okay, so if you're ever in a, uh, a situation where you get, you, you're injured, okay, or you get hurt, accidental death or disability or injury, yes. personal accident cover provides for that. Okay. okay. All right, then okay. we've got commercial clients, which we spoke about, corporate and commercial. Corporate is massive, commercial is smaller. Right, so major enterprises and groups often need tailor-made solutions for insurance. Right, so is insurance a tailor-made type of industry? Mm. Can you get lots of different types of products with lots of different type of features? No. They also need to take in account uh, the law. Okay. Thing. But can anything be insured? Or can almost anything be insured? Yes, I think almost anything can be insured. Okay, but would they do that for an individual? Uh, yes, they can. Possibly, but not always. Okay, so commercial and corporate clients have more leverage because their premiums are much larger. Okay, so do you think that insurers, will, would insurers be more happy to meet the needs of a corporate client? Um. What do you think? They'll be getting, um, I think they'll be getting a lot of money, but also risks are bigger as well. Okay, so yeah, bigger clients carry more risk, but bigger clients also bring in more revenue. So there's that yes. trade-off in terms of, do we satisfy the, the client's need by covering everything and by even covering other things that we, that we weren't really supposed to cover perhaps in the first place? It's a debate that the insurer needs to make. Okay, but corporates and commercial clients generally have some leverage in terms of negotiation and also settlement. Okay, okay. so if you have an event that occurred that wasn't really covered under your policy, okay, could the insurer cover it still? 
No, if it's not under your policy, it won't be covered. Okay, it won't be covered in the, in 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 any sense, but it can actually be covered. They call it an ex gratia payment, which we'll see later on in one of the other slides. Ex gratia. Okay. Okay, but it's something where it depends on the size of the client. Okay, so if the client is very very important to the business, right, they might be willing to pay for certain losses that aren't even covered in the contract. And if that's the case, that's viewed as an ex gratia payment. Right? And we'll, we'll discuss what that means in a bit more detail later. But it's, it's the same thing for a, um, a normal individual. Okay, you might not have a specific, um, let's say, a specific risk as part of your policy in terms of cover, but should something happen, and let's say you're a good client. Okay, so let's say, Melanie, you're a really good client. You haven't claimed from your insurer for a long time, right? Yes. Let's say you are in a car accident and there's something that occurred, but that but actually wasn't covered under your policy. So there was an exclusion or there was some sort of term and condition in your contract that, that the actual insurer could stand on. The insurer could actually refuse paying your claim based on that one little line right at the end of the contract. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. So, yes. do you agree the insurer can actually say, no, we're not going to pay for the claim? Yes, they can say that if they want to lose you as a client. <laughs> Probably. If they want to lose Melanie as a client, they're going to say no. If they're not yes. going to want to lose you as a client, they're going to use an ex gratia payment and they're going to say, well, all right, you've been a good client. Okay, We'll keep you on our books and we'll cover the loss of the damages that you've sustained. Does that create a good or bad impression? A good impression. A good impression. Okay, so things like that can happen. And that's the insurance industry. Okay, that's something that we'll cover later on. I think it might even be in this set of notes, but it definitely comes up later on in the course. Okay, if not in this set. All right, then we've just got a note about brokers. We know brokers and insurers rely on clients. Right, so they often move um, clients' portfolio depending on the needs. Okay, and depending on the risks. Right, should a broker be moving a client if the client isn't going to benefit from additional cover? Mm. Melanie? No, I no. don't think yes, they should. Yes, you're right. Yeah, they, they would lose out on that revenue. Okay, so it's called churning. You shouldn't do that. That's frowned upon. Okay, so if a broker, so for example, Melanie, you have car cov you have car insurance with a specific provider. Okay, so can the broker that sold you that policy come to you and say, well, Melanie, cancel that policy, open up this policy, and the policy that you're opening is exactly the same as the one that you just had. Can they do that? Uh, I'm not sure if they're allowed to do that, but then they'll be losing you. They'll be losing business. They'll be losing No, revenue. but you trust the broker, so you would think that they would be giving you something better or at Best, least at a lower premium. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's, that's why they can do that, but mm -hmm. they aren't allowed to do it if they take you from one institution and they give you to another institution and it's the exact same product, it's the exact same premium, it's the exact same cover. Right, because then they're not improving your cover in terms of losses that you can sustain. Okay, and that's frowned upon because the broker gets paid twice. They get paid commission from the first provider they sold the policy for, and then they get commission for the second policy that they sell, sold. Okay, so that's not allowed in the industry. Okay, that's churning. Okay, where they're just they're taking you from one provider to another. Right, there's nothing wrong with um, a broker that's, that's giving you a better product or that's giving you a better premium. Okay, so if they move you from one provider to another, well, then they better be doing that to either lower your premium or to give you more benefits. Okay. Okay, if that's not the case, then you need to question mark their motives. Okay, because brokers and brokers get paid based on commission. Right, so they're not always the... It's like, it's like, that, whole, it's like that whole debate we spoke about earlier about are you, asking adv are you asking for advice or, you, or, or are you asking for the product? Okay. Okay, it's about who do you trust in terms of is it the doctor that's honest or is it the doctor that's a bit dodgy? That, that's, that's the big question mark. Okay, and that's why okay. I've tried to debate that here in terms of the churning. You're not allowed to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, what is a public body? 
public body government government yeah government municipalities local or yes. provincial okay so public bodies are looking at large institutions do you agree yes okay so can large institu can large institutions be covered by one provider um, i think it is possible okay so would so let's let's talk about the government can can the government take out insurance with one provider for everything in government I, uh, I don't think it'll be financially uh, a good idea. For who? For uh, for that institution. For the insurer. The insurer, yes. Okay, because think about it. If public bodies... Do public bodies have a lot of liability? Yes. Yes, they do. So, is an insurer going to want to take on that risk? No. No. Okay, so generally insurers would want to limit their exposure as well. So they would be looking at only taking on a certain amount of risk. So public bodies are normally insured by multiple insurers because it's based on a collective basis. Okay. Okay, because it's risky for one insurer to take on all the damages for a particular public body. That's very, very large. Mm. Okay, but they need to protect against catastrophic loss. All right, so large... Think about the schools. I mean, we've heard the news reports. Schools were yeah. burnt in Limpopo by the students and teachers and staff, right? So they burnt their yeah. own property. Okay, but it wasn't their property. Whose property was it? Government. Government. Okay, so now what yes. does government now do? Government is now going to have to build those schools again, which they're probably going to burn down because that has happened. We've seen that in the news. They build yes. these facilities, they burn them down, and then they build new facilities. And why do they do that? It's because of insurance. Okay, they need to insure certain public bodies against catastrophic loss. Okay, so insurers, would insurers want to insure um, certain, let's say, municipalities in, in that particular area based on the, the, the news report that we've seen in the past? Definitely not. Well, they would, but they're going to want to increase the premium. Their they, premium, yes. Yeah, the, we the have to premium, be very high. Correct, correct. Okay, the premium is going to be higher because now the risk has increased. Yes. Okay, good. All right, there's the note about cover, so now we'll look at the details. Okay, multi -peril, I gave you a bit of an intro earlier. It's a policy that covers multiple sections in terms of one document. All right, so in the past, okay, long ago, okay, back in the day when, when insurers issued out contracts, you literally had to have a contract for everything. So one contract for the car, one contract for the house, one contract for this, one contract for that. Now, in today's world, you can have one document covering several different perils, okay, multi-peril mm. policy. So covering cover for different negative things from occurring. Okay. Okay, so not only theft, but maybe theft and fire. Okay. Okay, two different perils. Right, and then you'll also have one renewal date. Okay, so how often do you review your policies? Um, I think it's every year when your premiums go up. Okay, so do you, do you review it every year? Do you get the salesman or a salesman or woman in to discuss the policy and the cover that you have? Not really. They just send you an email. Okay. And um, do they normally look at your risks in terms of what has changed over the last 12 months? Uh, I think it's only if you have a claim. I think because I haven't had a claim in a while. Okay. The, the claims are when you're actually wanting to claim for certain losses. Yes. Right, so the thing is we need to keep our policies up to date. So if you're yes. not reviewing your policies, normally a good a good reliable broker, okay, mm -hmm. should be contacting you or having a discussion with you at least once a year, if not more. Okay, the better the broker, the more meetings you'll have with that individual. Because it's not about just meeting you once a year to sell you something. It's about finding yes. out what has changed in your life. So, for example, Melanie, did you and your husband have life cover before or after your son was born? Uh, after. After. Okay, so you took out life cover after your son was born? Yes. 
Okay, that's then that's good because now your son would definitely be part of the policy. Okay, let's yes. let's assume that you guys have another child. Yes. Okay, would you change your policy? Yes, you have to. You'd have to because now you need to include the other child on your policy. Yes. Okay, but if you don't, that other child isn't going to be covered. Covered, sure. Yeah. All right, so do you see why we need to have renewal, we need to view the risks, and we need to look at the premium? So, for example, if you do yes. have another child, that could change your profile with the insurer. Yes. Okay, or let's say, okay, another, another good question. Are you a smoker or a non-smoker? Non-smoker. Non-smoker. Right, so what happens if um, the debtor's department is really getting to you and you start smoking? My premiums will probably go higher. Yes. Because I'm a risk. Correct. Yes. But it's your responsibility to actually review to that with the yes. insurer. Because if You'll you don't, let's say, let's say, Melanie, let's say you don't inform your insurer that you've started smoking and you've still got life cover with that um, provider. Right. And then let's say smoking does lead um, to, to some sort of illness or whatever the case might be. And that's something that's covered under policy. Would the insurer pay out the claim? No, they wouldn't because you wouldn't. didn't disclose it to us. Exactly. Yes. Correct. You're right. Okay, because you didn't disclose that to them. So it's actually their prerogative. Uh, it's actually in their best interest to not pay out the claim if you didn't disclose things like that. Yes. Okay, so do you see the policy? You don't want to have to do this for like 10 different policies. You want to do this for one. And that's why we have a multi pair policy. Yes. Well, we spoke about policy wording in sections earlier. It's a standard way of presenting information. Right, so commercial multi pair policies use the multi mark 3 template or layout, okay, when wording specific okay. contracts. Okay, that's more commercial, so we look at small businesses or larger businesses. Right, sections mm -hmm. are going to be specific, so they'll deal with different things fire, theft, accidental damage public liability, etc., etc. Okay. Right, all risk is looking at issued of the total assets, okay? So looking at the actual value of the assets and we're taking everything into consideration. Okay, total value. Right, normally only issued for a large corporate risk. Why only corporate? And not individual. We spoke about their role. Corporates are much bigger players, hey? Yes. Okay, so insurers are, um, insurers are, um, how can I put it? They rely a lot on their large clients. Okay. Okay. Still all right. It's a bit theoretical. We're going to get into some interesting examples just now. Okay, so just trying to get through all of the, um, the more, uh, how can I say, um, th theoretical part of it, and then we'll look at some, some discussion points just now. Okay. All right, so intermediary okay. we spoke about, you get brokers, you get underwriters, and you get agents. Okay, the brokers are responsible for what? For selling the product. Correct. And the underwriter is responsible for what? For um, identifying the risks. Correct. Identifying and measuring the risk. Good. Okay, and then agents, what do they do? Very similar to brokers, except... Yeah. Uh, uh, no idea. They can sell other things as well. Okay. Okay, they're less specialized. All right, so a broker sells a specific um, provider's products. Okay, they're the broker, okay, for that particular business. An agent. So think about an agency. An agency can really represent anyone. Yes. Okay, that's what an agent does. An agent can sell policies that's not part of their main occupation. Okay, so you might be selling um, investment products, but you can also sell insurance. Okay, then you're considered an agent more than a broker. A broker would be, well, you can only sell a specific product. It's only insurance or it's only investments. Okay. Okay. Have you heard of the phase and phase ombud? I've heard of the ombudsman. Okay. What is phase? Have you heard of that? No. Not. Okay. So phase is when your broker came to you to sell you those products. What did the broker do? Did they introduce themselves? 
Yes, they do. Did they disclose information to you? Yes. Okay, so FaZe is looking at the Financial Advisory and Intermediary Services Act. Okay, it's legislation that brokers and agents and representatives are going to have to follow when representing themselves as intermediaries. Okay, so this, this slide is looking at that, intermediaries. Middle men and women that are going to help facilitate this industry, being the short-term insurance industry. Okay, okay, so if they don't disclose everything to you up front before you become their client, can you take them to the ombudsman? Yes. Yes, because they've misrepresented certain things. Right, so when a broker and an agent or a representative comes to you, they have to disclose everything in terms of how do they get remunerated? Is it commission? Is it, um, is it salary based? Is it what? And they need to also identify how much they're going to be paid. That's normally disclosed to you and you need to accept it. Okay, because intermediaries actually determine how much they charge you. Have you, have you thought about that? No, I haven't actually. Okay, okay. <laughs> intermediaries actually negotiate their rate and their rate is set by the industry. Okay, we'll see that later on. Okay, they determine their rate and it's a scale. Right, it's a scale in terms of rate. So they can charge you anything from 1%, 2%, depending on what they decide to charge you. Right, and see, that the things like that need to be disclosed. Okay. Okay, because it's a, it's a scale. All right, you negotiate. Okay, remember an intermediary is a salesman. Okay, they're selling a product. Right, so when you sell a product, let's say, let's say, you're, uh, let's say you're manufacturing um, something. Okay, what are you manufacturing, Melanie? What are you making to sell? Um, okay, I'll give you an example. Bags. Okay, so you're making bags to sell. Right, those bags that you're making to sell, you're the product provider. Okay, so you're, you're making those bags to sell. Okay, but now, what happens if you employ an agent to help you sell those bags? That agent is going to have to add a commission, right? Yes. Okay, and that commission is dependent on the agent, but obviously regulated by the industry. Okay. And that's what we look at. So the phase on bit is looking at disputes, and phase is looking at the legislation that governs what they can and what they can't do. Right, again, something we'll see later uh, in a separate chapter where they look at legislation. We'll look at the phase um, act okay, in more detail. For now, just, just have a general sense of what all of these things are. Okay. okay. This is interesting now, Melanie. Um, Lloyd's broker. Okay, so you've probably heard of Lloyd's before. If you haven't, this is what they do. They're an association of underwriters. Okay, you, you gave me a good um, gauge of what an underwriter is earlier. Okay, remember an underwriter establishes the risk. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so underwriters are actually specialists because they can identify if there is or isn't a risk and they can identify is this risk insurable or not. Okay. Okay. All right, so the textbook talks about how Lloyd's formed. Okay, so just to give you the short story of what they've described in the textbook. Okay, Lloyd's started in London. Okay, so you, you've probably heard Lloyd's of London. Yes, I've had, heard that thing. Okay, so I, I, uh, my guess is you guys probably have some policies either with them directly or indirectly in terms of they having underwritten some of your contracts because think about it you guys are importing and exporting these large items of equipment okay yes. that's a specialist area um chances are your legal department or your risk management department is probably dealing with lloyds in some form of another in terms of the insurance yes okay so if we're looking at lloyds lloyds is a underwriter that was created in London. Okay, so back in the day, there used to be a coffee house. So do you like going to coffee shops? Yes. Why? Um, Who do you go I enjoy with? Drinking. Um, my husband. Okay, and probably a group of friends. Yeah, and sometimes friends or my sisters. Okay, so you're going with all of those individuals. And what happens at the coffee house or the coffee shop? Um, you enjoy drinking coffee, you also have cake with it. Yeah. And people are talking about what? Uh, Most of the time. Not all the time. Yeah. 
their problems, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so most of the time people are talking about their problems. And, and that's exactly what happened in London several years ago. Okay, business men and women used to frequent a coffee house where they used to talk about all their problems. Okay, so theft in the business, employees not working, um, damages to the equipment, etc., etc., right? And that's how Lloyd's was formed. So Lloyd's was formed by a group of business owners that were willing to contribute towards establishing risk so they could cover it if something negative had occurred. Okay, okay that's like the beginning of the pooling of funds. Because think about it, if they're all business owners, they're all suffering with similar risks. Yeah. So they could join forces and say, well, okay, if person A is struggling, right, person B, C, and D could help support that individual for that month. But then the next month, person B now struggles, and then A, C, and D help that individual. Yes. Okay, so that's pretty much how the system ran, and it obviously grew a lot bigger to what it is today. Okay, so Lloyd's is massive in today's world in terms of providing insurance and even reinsurance. Okay, we haven't discussed reinsurance in too much detail yet, but this is the website, okay. Okay. Lloyd's has a website and they're international. So even in South Africa, okay, they, the offices in South Africa are in Sandton, okay, and they operate globally, right? And what do they do? They're an underwriter mainly, right? So Lloyd's is focusing on specialized underwriting expertise because remember we said earlier last week who can be a risk manager mm. anyone Do you agree? anyone yes yes right your is your doctor a risk manager yes yeah because they look after your health yes okay is your um your your personal assistant at the gym a risk manager Yes. Yes, because they manage with your exercise. Okay, they manage that. All right. Um, risk management is looking at the specialist. And the specialist is the one that helps you to ensure certain losses that could or, or that could occur, basically. Yes. Okay. So, do you think certain things are insurable? Or, under, uh, or can you underwrite certain um, risks that are considered to be, let's say, out of the ordinary? So can, uh, okay, let me rephrase the question. Can you okay. underwrite any risk? Yes, I'm, sh I'm sure it's possible. Okay, you actually can, yeah. So um, if you look at uh, one of the pages in the textbook, page 13 actually gives you some examples about risks that have been underwritten by Lloyd's. Right? And some of these are, are really, really interesting. Okay, and we'll, we'll write them down okay. here. Okay, so the first one is the Titanic. Okay? Do you think they would have underwritten the Titanic? Um, we know the Titanic was the was ship that sink. was believed to not be able to sink. Yeah. Okay, but do you think Lloyd would have underwritten that? Are all ships not able to sink? No. No. Okay, all ships have no. a, a potential for sinking. Alright, so... Yeah. A risk that Lloyd's have underwritten, the Titanic. They actually underwrote the Titanic in terms of the vessel that could not sink. Underwrite, underwriting means establishing the risk of it sinking and not sinking. Okay, okay what about this one? Um, a prize offered by Cutty Sark Whiskey for the finder of the Loch Ness Monster. Okay, so do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? Is that a true story? No, it's not. No, okay, but then this particular whiskey provider, okay, this whiskey provider must have had a campaign um, associated with their product that probably awarded someone for if they ever had found the Loch Ness Monster. Mm -hmm. And could that be underwritten? It's possible. It's possible, and it was. Okay, Lloyd under underwrote that. Okay, here's another one. A South African actress, okay, um, Kerry Wallace. She had yes. to shave her hair bald for a Star Trek movie. And, okay. and she was worried that her hair wouldn't grow back. 
Okay. Do you think it's possible to underwrite that or to insure it? Yes, it's possible because she's an actor. Uh, yeah, and she's she relies an actor, on a actress. So, yes. so, um, so Lloyd, this was actually something that they insured. They insured. In insured, I'm missing an R here. R. Okay, R E D. They insured Kerry Wallace. Okay, for her hair not growing back. <laughs> All right. So if her hair doesn't grow back, she would have got paid out. Yeah. Interesting, hey. So yeah. she would have paid a premium for her hair not growing back. Yeah. Okay. Here's the one. Bruce Springsteen. Are you familiar with Bruce Springsteen? Yes. Okay. Bruce Springsteen insured his voice for three point five million pounds. Wow. So if something happened to his voice, he would get paid out three point five million pounds. Wow. Alright, and, and the last one here is quite unbelievable. Okay, so um have you ever been to a comedy club? Uh yes. Or a comedy show? Yes, I have. Okay, and, and uh what what happens to the audience at the comedy show? They laugh a lot, right? Yes, you do. <laughs> okay, so you've you've probably laughed so much at a comedy club that uh, you almost died. Your stomach right? pains. Yes. Hey, hey, Melanie. So, so have your you stomach pains. Stomach pains. So were those pains yes. so bad that you almost died? No, no. <laughs> okay, but some people say that, right? Some people say the show, yes. their shows are so funny that you'll die laughing. Yeah. Okay, so how about this? Lloyd's underwritten a comedy theatre group, they insured themselves against the risk of a member of their audience actually laughing so hard that they died. Oh my word. <laughs> Can you imagine? Alright, and that's the that's type of business, that's the type of business that Lloyd's has underwritten. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> the comedy house, so the comedy house that you went to, let's, let's, let's take it back to um, real life. So, uh, what was the comedy house called? Where was it? Uh, it was King and Kings and Queens of Comedy. Okay, Kings and Queens of Comedy. At the was, ICC. That in, was that in yes. Durban? Yes. Okay, at the ICC. At the ICC, the International Convention yeah. Center. Yes. Okay, so you went to the Kings and Queens of Comedy. Okay, so yes. do you agree that show is probably so funny? And the organizers, the organizers of the show, if they believed that their jokes were so funny that someone in the audience could possibly die, they would have to take out insurance against that loss. Yes, I'm sure they do. And that's what Lloyd's did. Lloyd's underwritten a comedy theatre's group, okay, against, they insured against someone dying from laughter at that particular show. My word. Okay, so from a, um, from a commercial point of view, um, did Lloyd's, did, a good, did, did they do a good deal there in terms of a policy, a contract? Yes, I'm sure because what if someone really dies of laughing? But I mean, what are the chances gonna... already of someone dying from laughing? I was... Hey, I think it's very minimal. <laughs> probably. I it's mean, very laughter's minimal. probably going to make you live longer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> okay, so that was actually quite a quite an interesting one. That um, with insurance, you can almost sell anyone a policy as long as they believe something so much that you can actually convince them to take out cover. Yes. See, and that was that whole debate earlier about insecurity. Right, the, 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 the theater house, the comedy house, they were insecure mm -hmm. about someone actually dying from laughter because they believed that their jokes were so funny, that Lloyd's was willing to insure them against that loss. Yeah. Okay, and that's, and that's the insurance industry, that's how it works. It's all about underwriters establishing risk. And if an individual or client is convinced of that risk, that's a policy, yeah. that's, a, that's a deal. Okay. Okay. All right, so now we look at insurers. We spoke about Lloyd's, that's just one. You also get others, you get private companies. So private companies can issue insurance policies. You get public or mutual companies. Okay, these are almost non-existent. Okay, because no shareholders, right, we're only looking at policyholders. But in today's world, shareholders own those companies. 
policyholders don't own the companies. Okay, okay, that's why we say they're almost non-existent. Okay, because back in the day, the policyholders were actually the owners, which is quite different okay. to how it's run in today's world. Okay. Right, captives we'll look at later. Right, captive insurance, that's also something that self-insurance, we'll, we'll broaden on that in a later module. Lloyd, we now spoke about. Lloyd is actually very involved in, in the South African um, Short-Term Insurance Act. Okay, so you know our legislation? Yes. Okay, so our legislation has actually been provided by a lot of the correspondence and the input from Lloyd's. Okay, because Lloyd's was one of the first underwriters in the world, or if not the first. Okay. Okay. And then we've got mutual indemnity associations and then P&I clubs. p and is looking at protection and indemnity, referring mainly to marine. Okay, so marine looking at large cargo ships, crew and okay. passengers. Right, all SA insurers are subjective are subjected to the Short-Term Insurance Act. They have to follow it. And if you're a company, you also need to follow the Companies Act. Okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Then a note here about the reinsurers. What did we say a reinsurer was from last week? Reinsurer. What does a reinsurer mm. do? They insure the who? Reinsurers insure who? Insurer. Exactly. Good. Reinsurers provide insurance for the insurer. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They take risk. They either share the risk, okay, or they take all of it. Or they can decline okay. the risk depending on the situation. Okay, so reinsurers okay. provide cover for the insurers. Okay. It's like it's like peace of mind. Transferring it from one place to another okay okay more players other players so earlier you spoke about um the car accidents and then claims okay yes if i'm looking at a loss adjuster or a claims assessor what do they do uh, they assess the claims that exactly. you put through all right so is that a very specialized area yes it is possibly yes because why? We've got someone who's been in an accident. So, for example, if you're in an accident, okay, mm -hmm. and let's say the accident isn't as bad as you think, and it, it'll, always, it'll always be worse than you actually think it is, right? Yeah. Why? Because you're the person in the actual accident. Sure. Okay, so let's say you've got, um, let's say you've got, okay, you used, the, you used 200,000 as an example, so I'm going to use that as well. Okay, so let's say you've got a 200,000 rand um, vehicle that is covered for 200,000 Rand. Yes. Okay. And let's say uh, you're in an accident, but the accident is just a little scratch on the side of the vehicle. Yes. What are you going to say to your insurer? Pay me 200,000. I was in an accident. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. But what is the assessor going to do? He's going to assess the situation and not, uh, and make sure that you're not claiming more than you should be. Exactly. That's their job. Okay. Their job is to verify the loss. Okay. So the assessor is going to say, well, this is only a scratch. Okay. It's mm -hmm. only going to be a 2,000 Rand claim, let's say. Okay. You can't yeah. claim for the full value of the vehicle. All right. That's what they're doing. They're verifying the loss that had occurred. Okay. Because think about it. All right. The, the person in the accident is always going to be more... Um, uh, how can I say? They're going to they're gonna overstate the loss than the insurer. The yes. insurer is going to understate the loss. Yes. Okay. And then the assessor, they'll know exactly what the loss is. Yes. Okay, so do you see why you need these three different parties? Yes. Because the insurer provides the product, they provide the cover. The insured is the person covered. And then you need someone that needs to agree. Okay, both parties need to agree well, okay. This is actually how much is, or this is actually what the loss is. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, then you've got motor assessors, which is a specialist relating to motor vehicle repairs. And then you've got a risk manager, which we've, uh, which we've spoken about. A risk manager is looking holistic. Okay, so identifying all the risks that may affect the company. Not only things that need to be insured, but also things that are outside of the scope of insurance. Okay, even like security. Okay. Just making a, suggest, uh, a suggestion to improve security is risk management. 
Okay, how often do you have to change your password, Melanie, when you log into your work computer? Every month. Every month. Okay, so yes. you see they've identified that as a risk. And that's why every month mm -hmm. you need to change your password. Yes. Okay, that's risk control. That's not risk. That's not insurance. It's risk control. Yes. Okay. All right, regulators, what do you think these are? We spoke about this has them. To do with, this has to do with the law. Good. Okay, FSB and the phase on bit. All right, so yes. what is the role of the SA, uh, S? I'm saying S, F. FSB. What is the FSB responsible for? Any idea? Uh, it's, doesn't it? Okay, financial services. Um, I think there are certain regulations that a final uh, financial institution has to abide by. Well done. Good. Okay, the institutions are regulated by the FSBs. Well done. Okay, so this is their mission. All right, the Financial Services Board's mission is to promote and to maintain a sound financial investment environment in South Africa. Right, so okay. who contributes to that environment the most? The financial institutions, exactly. like the banks. Okay, 100% like the banks. And? Insurance companies, Good. anything that has, yeah, that has financial or monetary Good. Okay, you're right. Okay, so those banks and those insurers are very, very large players in the market. And that's what they're trying to promote. The Financial Services Board is trying to promote fair treatment of customers, okay, the consumers. They need to look at financial soundness. So those, those institutions aren't going to go bankrupt because if they go bankrupt, does any vehicle get repaired? No. No, even if you're paying those insurance, if they're not sound, if those institutions aren't financially sound, the system is broken. Yes. Okay. They also look at systematic stability of the services industry, and they look at integrity of the market and the institutions. That's their goal. That's their mission. That's what they're tasked with doing, is to keep a sound financial investment industry. Okay. okay. Happy with that one? Yes. What do you think the ombudsman does? Phase on bid. They also, uh, if there are issues that arise, they make sure that um, that all that there's fair treatment to the consumer. Very good. And okay. to the institution, yeah. Very, very good. Okay, treatment. How people are treated. How customers are treated. So, if customers yeah. aren't treated fairly. Can they go to the insurer? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. They but, go to the ombudsman. Okay. Yes. But let's say let's say you do go to the insurer, and the insurer doesn't pay out your claim still. Then what do you do? Then, then you go to the ombudsman. Correct. Then you can go further. And you lay you a can, complaint. Correct. Yes. You can lay a complaint. You can ra raise a dispute. Yes. Well done. Okay. And those bodies. Okay. The phase ombud. Right, you get other ombuds as well in terms of um, banking ombud, uh, short-term insurance. There's all different ombuds. Okay, the phase ombud is looking for looking at the financial advisory and intermediary service. Okay, so if your advisor, if they're not servicing you correctly as a client, if they're not meeting the obligation, what can you do? You can go to the ombud. Okay. So if your advisor, your broker, your intermediary, if they're not providing you with the best possible service and you've addressed them and you've addressed it with them and they still haven't yeah. given you a better product or service, then you need to mm -hmm. seek other advice and you need to uh, make a dispute then uh, or, or lodge a dispute then with the ombudsman. Yes. Okay. All right. How are we doing, Melanie? Do you need a quick break? Good. No, no, I'm good. You sure? Okay, we've, yes. we've got quite a bit more still to get through. Um, a lot of this we've discussed already, so now it's, it's just putting the theory to the actual concepts. Okay, so we've okay. spoken about self-insurance and non-insurance. Can you define okay. the difference? Mm. What's the difference? 
No idea. <laughs> okay. Self insurance, who does it? Uh, I think uh, me as a person, yourself. Correct. The business. All right. The, the, the person. So if you're looking at self insurance, so if you had to self insure your vehicle, what would you do, Melanie? Um, I would do it on my, myself. Yeah, you would have to contribute funds to a, an account yeah. that will hopefully cover certain losses if they do arise. Yes. Okay, and non-insurance, <laughs> if you don't have insurance, what does that mean? That you're not covered. There's no insurance. Correct, there's no insurance. Okay, you're just going to uh, live life as it is. Whatever happens, happens. We're not going to worry. Yes. Okay, so with, with self-insurance, there are advantages and there are disadvantages. Advantages are, well, as the fund grows, who keeps the re uh, returns? The insurer. No, the insured. Self-insurance. Oh, yes. Okay, so self-insurance, here's the example, Melanie. Okay, so you've, you've been paying insurance to your car insurer for how many years? Five, ten? Less than five? Uh... The last insurance is less than five years. Less than five years. Okay, so for, for yeah. less than five years, you've been paying them car insurance. Okay, on average, yeah. just give me an average amount. How much is it? One, two, three, four, five thousand. How many? Seven hundred and for car insurance. Okay, seven hundred. Okay, so we're being very exact. So seven hundred. Okay, yes. per month. Yes. All right, so if you're spending seven hundred rand per month, Okay, and we're looking at less than five years. So let's say it's five years. Okay, times mm -hmm. five years. Five times 12 months. Okay, that's uh, it's 500, it's 700 per month times 12 months times five years. All right, so 700 times five times 12 gives you 42,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, 42,000 is the total that we would have contributed over the last five years, assuming that those premiums have stayed the same. Okay. Okay. If you didn't pay that toward the insurer, where would that 42,000 be sitting? With you. It will be sitting in your savings account or your investment account. It'll be sitting with you. Okay, and obviously that 42,000 would have grown as well because of all the interest and the return that you would have generated on it, right? Yeah. Okay, so 500 Rand per month for five years. And let's say if you just, if you just left it in a, if you just left it in a, um, a savings account and you're earning, um, let's keep it modest, okay? So if we're just earning inflation, 6%, all right, as a return. So 6% interest, like a money market type account. Okay, so if we look at time value of money, 60 months at 6% per month, all right, with an, with a monthly amount of 700 a month gives you a future value of okay 48,000 right so 48,806 uh, how much is it four eight eight three nine okay three nine right that's the amount that would have grown in the account and would that be the insurers or would that be yours mine it would be yours all right because that's self-insurance so is that an advantage? Yes, it is. Okay, that is the advantage. But obviously your vehicle probably is worth more than 48,000. Is your yes, vehicle definitely. worth more than 48,000? Yes. Okay, so is that a disadvantage? Yes. Yes, because if you had to replace the whole vehicle, you wouldn't be able to do that. But if sure. it was a... If it was a scratch on the vehicle, you probably could um, you you yeah. probably could cover it. Yes. Okay. So do you see the advantage and disadvantage? Disadvantage: mm -hmm. if I if I keep everything, if I if I self fund it, self insurance. Advantage mm -hmm. for self insurance is the fund is yours. You can do whatever you like with it. Okay. You haven't had an accident in the last few years with it, so that forty eight thousand could be maybe new mags, okay, or a nice sound system. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if something did happen, that would be a disadvantage because that's a catastrophic loss. So now I, yes. can't, I can't replace the vehicle with 48,000. No. Okay, so do you see how there's advantage and the disadvantage? Yes. Okay. Self-insurance also advantage. Premiums are not dependent on others. 
Okay, so you pay the premium based on your risk. Okay, so you're probably paying a, a, a lower premium compared to more risky people. Yes. Okay. All right, and then disadvantage, well, capital is tied up. All right, so disadvantage with self-insurance is you're keeping all of those funds set aside. It's being tied up. It's not being utilized elsewhere. Okay, you can't use those, you can't use that 48,000 that you've saved for anything else other than future possible repairs for the vehicle. Yes. If you're self-funding it. Yes. Okay. Self-insurance, there's strong incentive to reduce claims or losses. Okay, so you don't want to claim. You don't want to fix the vehicle. So, for example, here's a question, Melanie. If you okay. didn't have insurance and you had a small scratch on your vehicle, would you repair it? No, I wouldn't. I'll leave it like that. Probably not, yeah, because there's a strong incentive to reduce claims or losses. So you're thinking, well, yes. it's just a little scratch. I'm not going to take from the fund because that's the self-insured fund. I'd rather just yes. drive around with a small little scratch. Yes. But now you're paying 700 a month. If you get a small little scratch on your vehicle, what are you going to do? I'll claim for it. <laughs> yes, why? Because mm, it's covered. Because I'm paying, yeah. And you're paying, yeah, exactly, good. Okay, so did you see how the differences are in terms of self-insurance? We're focusing on you paying all of those losses rather than someone yes. else. Yes. Happy? Yes. Okay. All right, we've got a lot of these bodies. Don't worry, they're not important. I haven't seen any questions come up in detail about any of these bodies. Okay. The okay. only ones that they, they touch on slightly are things <laughs> from a South African context. So, obviously, the first one, South African Insurance Association. Yeah. Okay, they wrote okay. your textbook, okay, and okay. IRMSA, which is the Institute of Risk Management. But right, those are, okay. are slightly more important than the others. Okay? The others come up, okay. they discuss, they mention it, they cover it in the theory, but from an exam point of view, I've yet to see them tested specifically. Okay, because remember, it's more scope. So they're trying to give you an idea of everything, and then if you do want to read further on certain sections, then we can go a bit deeper in those sections. Right, but as I said, from a, um, a high-level point of view, they've tried to focus more on things from a South African context, okay? So mainly the South African Insurance Association and mainly the South African Institute of Risk Management. Okay, because risk management, remember, we said it's a nice industry to be in because since the crisis, everyone's worried about risk this, risk that, right? Yes. Okay, so there's a lot of money to be made in risk management because you're offering solutions, you're trying to provide ways and means to keep risks low. And companies are all about reducing risk and maximizing return. Okay. Okay? Yes, okay. Okay. All right. What is an education association? Think about no what idea. Education. What is education? Um, it's about teaching. Yeah, teaching or studying or learning. Studying, yeah. Okay. So, do the rules change in the industry? Um, I'm sure it would because it's a different type of... They can, yeah. The, it's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's a very young industry. When you look at insurance, insurance isn't as old as banking. Remember, you need banking before you, you, you look at insurance because insurance is almost like a... Um, it's like an afterthought. It's like... After everything else is going well, then we think about insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not, it's not the first thing we think about, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so when looking at education, things can change. And that's why we have things like CETAs. Right, the Insurance Sector Education and Training Authority in CETA assists with training people with skills from a risk management or insurance point of view. Right, so okay. um, school leavers that don't completely finish their high school, uh, um, yes. let's say education in terms of uh, FET and, and so on, and, and then tertiary as well, they can actually get into a CETA where they'll be exposed to this industry, okay, looking at risk management or looking at insurance. Okay. Okay, and obviously with more skills come better knowledge and information. Right, the financial sure. services sector is looking at transformation in the industry. Okay, so we need mm -hmm. transformation. Transformation is key. Trans transformation has always be, been a focal point, okay, especially uh, in a country like ours where we come yeah. from a, a background where certain groups of individuals benefited and others weren't benefiting. 
And that's why we need change. Things need to transform. We can't have things the same because that doesn't move the country forward. No. Okay. So when looking at short-term insurance, we're, fo we're focusing on ways to address inequality. So one of the big debates is this, low-income market. Do you think low-income earners are going to be able to afford insurance? No. Definitely not. Okay, and that's why, um, think about someone who's in a low-income type of environment. Okay, are they going to be wanting to take out insurance? No. They're not, because they have other needs that they, they need to meet. Yes. So now, how do we try bringing more people into the pool? Okay, remember we spoke about the pooling? Yes. All right, if more people are in the pool, is it better or worse? It's better. It's a lot better. Okay, yes. so you want more customers or more clients as part of the industry because if I make the pool bigger, the premiums are lower because we've got more people that we can look at um, pooling in terms of resources that they have. Okay, yes. so from a short-term insurance market, okay, the, the only product that's quite popular uh, right now that you often see people selling is funeral cover. Okay, that's more yeah. long-term than short-term, but that's something yes. that's affordable for the low-income market. Yes. Okay, because that's something that, that is cheap and affordable that they can afford. But obviously, we need to try offer more. Okay, so if this is an industry that you're wanting to expand on, you'd be looking at innovative ways to try and make insurance more, um, more inclusive. Okay, so how can we get everyone in the industry taking out a policy? That's what you're trying to do. And that's why when you look at different providers, you get different products. You get the most comprehensive products and then you get the most basic products. And the reason for that is you try and make the pool as big as possible. That's their goal. So if, at an insurer, their goal is always to grow the pool. It's to grow that book. They want the, they want the biggest book. The bigger the book, the more successful the business, generally, not always. Obviously, you need a quality, uh, you need quality in terms of book. Quantity doesn't always help. Yes. 